you everyone for coming. I'm delighted to see you here. I've already had a few comments in the Q&A about wanting my email address. I have put them on the title slide and again at the end, I would be delighted to hear from any of you. So welcome to my presentation today, Canadian Nurses on the Western Front from Passchendaele to Peace. At 3.50 a.m. on July 31st, 1917, the Allies attacked German forces across an 11-mile front in the Ypres sector, the beginning of the Third Battle of Ypres. On August 1st, nurses and other medical staff at Canadian Casualty Clearing Station No. 2, stationed at Remy Siding, just south of Paparinga, battled to care for the more than 2,000 wounded soldiers who swamped the 300 available beds in a single 24-hour period. The unit's war diary notes that as convoys arrived by train at the front door, more casualties were arriving by car at the back door. Men on stretchers lay in hallways and the mess room, and more were placed on the grass outside in the rain because there was no more room inside. Canadian nurses Mildred Forbes and Laura Holland, close friends who had arrived a mere two weeks before, were veterans of the Gallipoli campaign in Salonika, but they had never seen anything like this. One realizes the horrors of war more than ever in this place, Mildred wrote home. One sees so many tragedies all the time. Just weeks later, she would become acting matron, responsible for the care of the casualties flooding into her station and responsible for the morale of the unit. Under ordinary circumstances, the clearing station had nine nursing sisters, but in this emergency, that was expanded to 32. The operating room worked around the clock in shifts, the medical staff snatched food when they could, and the nurses worked long hours on a little sleep. This was not the first crisis that Canadian nurses had coped with, nor would it be the last. In clearing stations and hospitals, on ambulance trains and in operating theaters, Canadian nurses withstood shell fire and bombing raids, illness and emotional trauma to care for their patients across the Western Front. Through the nurses' own writings and some of their photographs, this talk illustrates their unique experiences as Canadians, as military officers, and as nurses on the Western Front during the last months of the war and beyond from Passchendaele to peace. But first, who were these Canadian nurses and what made them distinctive? In August 1914, when the First World War began, Canada was a dominion in the British Empire, and so it was automatically at war when Britain declared it. Although Canada did have its own parliament and legal system, it didn't have its own foreign policy. Canadian citizens, as a result, carried British passports, were considered British subjects, and flew the Union Jack. In October 1914, 104 military nursing sisters had accompanied the Canadian Expeditionary Force overseas. The competition for those hundred places was fierce. Hundreds of nurses from across Canada had applied. The requirements were straightforward. Military nurses had to be between 25 and 40 years of age, of good moral character, of course, British subjects, and most importantly, be graduates of three-year nurse training programs. Newly appointed Matron-in-Chief Margaret MacDonald fought strenuously to ensure that her military nurses were all trained graduates. With a few exceptions, she did succeed no VADs or untrained women carried out nursing duties in Canadian hospitals overseas, although some did serve as secretaries, housekeepers, and dietitians. Over 2,800 Canadian military nurses served overseas during the course of the war. As Cynthia Toman has documented, the cohort was, for the most part, white, Protestant, and Canadian born though many had British relatives. Most were English speaking, 
Although two of the war hospitals staffed by Canadians were run by mostly French speaking nurses and medical staff. In Canada by 1914, nursing was seen as a respectable profession and it attracted the daughters of elite families. Mildred Forbes, for instance, was related to one of the wealthiest families in Montreal, while her cousin Cecily Galt was the daughter of a judge. Bilingual Julia Peltier, she is pictured on the screen with her brother, was from an influential French-Canadian political family. The nurses came from across Canada, from Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia to the west coast of British Columbia. And despite loyalties to many different training schools and local regions, they shared a dedication to their profession and its ethics, a pride in their uniform and in their country. And about that uniform. The dress uniform, which you see on the four nurses in the center, was navy blue with red piping, a double row of brass buttons, and a navy blue greatcoat or cape. The working uniform, which you see Al nursing sister Alfreda Atril, pictured on the left, dressed in, was a distinctive light medium blue, which earned the Canadian nurses the nickname Bluebirds. It too was trimmed with a double row of brass buttons, worn with a leather belt, white veil, and tan boots with a white apron worn on the wards. And you see the ward uniform with the apron on nursing sister Ruby Peterkins, who's pictured at the right. Both uniforms carried the stars of rank on the shoulders. Although many of the nurses hid them with cardigans when they were on the wards to avoid controversy. Alone among the allied forces, the Canadian nurses held the rank, pay, and privileges of officers. Nursing sisters held the relative rank and pay of lieutenants, matrons, that of captain, and the matron in chief, that of major, the first woman in the British Empire so, delegate, so designated. And they all held commissions in the Canadian Army. By war's end, the Canadians in France staffed six general hospitals with up to 2,000 beds each, six stationary hospitals with 600 beds apiece, four casualty clearing stations, and a number of smaller hospitals, all on the Western Front. Many of those had been organized by universities with medical schools, such as McGill and Laval. An additional 10 general hospitals, seven convalescent hospitals, and four specialty hospitals were based in England. The Canadians had done sterling and valued nursing during the Gallipoli campaign, in Salonika, in Russia, in England, on hospital ships, and throughout all the major battles on the Western Front since December 1914. Like the Canadian Corps, the Canadian nurses and their work in hospitals had earned the respect of the Allied nations. <clears throat> when a man was wounded, stretcher bearers carried them to a first aid poster field ambulance, and they were then transported to a clearing station where triage operations and treatments were carried out. The pairs of clearing stations took turns one received casualties, which gave the other the chance to evacuate. Wilhelmina Mowat at number three clearing station explained that we usually received a convoy of wounded in the early morning. We would receive the wounded, and as soon as a train came in, those who could travel were sent down the line to other hospitals. Those too severely wounded or who had to be operated on immediately, we kept until such time as it would be safe for them to travel. We worked hard day and night when there was a big push on. Those sent down the line were cared for at either a stationary hospital or a general hospital. From there, men were sent to England for further treatments or sent back up the line to convalescent camps and the trenches. So for instance, 21-year-old Private Fred Lord of the 1st Battalion Scots Guards 
was wounded in the right arm and shoulder on July 31st, the first day of the battle. He was treated at field ambulance number nine and British casualty clearing station number 66, and by August 2nd had been transported to number one Canadian General Hospital in Etap. That's where Canadian nursing sister Florence Sheridan wrote to his mother on August 9th to tell her that Fred had had his right arm amputated at the shoulder, sorry, at the elbow, and had other wounds in his shoulder, but after being very sick, was now progressing favorably. From number one general, Fred would eventually have been sent back to England for treatment and convalescence. I am very grateful to Leslie Lord for sending me these details about their father and about nursing sister Sheridan. To return to the battle to care during the third battle Ypres, fighting conditions were appalling. The preliminary bombardment churned up the earth while ongoing rain turned the battlefields to a thick glutinous mud. Peter Hart calls those conditions a hell on earth that has come to symbolize the whole of the war. Elsie Collis at number one Canadian general in a tap repeatedly wrote in her diary, pouring all the time and cold. The men come in soaked through and through, wrote Mildred Forbes, and they are so caked with mud that they are about unrecognizable. Euphemia Denton at neighboring clearing station number three commented on October 7th that the rain is simply pelting on the roof. The poor men are so cold and damp coming in today. I was kept busy warming them up this morning for the tents are so difficult to heat. Euphemia, like many other nurses, took last messages for their mothers, for the laddies who died, and all her spare moments were spent writing letters about their last days and moments. The nurses dealt with more than wounds. As early as July 31st, Elsie Collis noted a convoy of patients coming into number one Canadian general suffering from a new kind of gas. Their eyes are very sore, she noted, also chests and throats. It was the notorious mustard gas, which as Christine Hallett describes, burned any piece of skin or mucous membrane it touches including the tissues of the airways and the walls of the gut. She continues, the eyes would then would sting, then swell and close, and the blindness that followed would last at least 10 days. Claire Gass, newly arrived at clearing station number two at the beginning of November, had quite a busy night in the gas tents. Such sick, sick men from the recent gas attacks. She had been issued a gas mask before leaving for the clearing station, but she does not record if she too suffered from the lingering gas in the wards as she treated her patients. Some other nurses did, in fact. The Canadians and other allied nurses also had to cope with enemy attacks. Remy Siding in the Eat Plus sector was a pretty hot spot at times, commented Mildred Forbes, but as she philosophically continued, well, we all have to take our chance. And when one sees the splendid men thrown away, one feels, why should we value our lives? I have a young officer here, only 24, who is an organist who has just had his right arm amputated. I shall never forget his utter misery when he was told. Euphemia Denton, close by, had a close call when she left the ward to go to the mess one night. I stopped outside to speak to someone and whiz through the air came a bang and a flare. A bomb had struck just where she would have been if she had kept on walking, but she was unhurt. Throughout October, the casualties continued as British then Anzacs attempted to capture Passchendaele Ridge. 
General Haig then ordered the Canadian Corps to the attack. Their leader, General Arthur Curry, planned a four-phased attack that began on October 26th, and by mid-November, the ridge and the village were in Allied hands. According to the Canadian War Museum, Third Battle Ypres cost the Canadian forces almost 16,000 casualties, while the British lost a total, total of 275,000 and the Germans 220,000. Though casualties continued to arrive, the Canadian nurses were at last able to take their regular time off. Claire Gass went lorry hopping to nearby towns, the equivalent of hitchhiking during the First World War. Harriet Drake with number three general was allowed to go to dances once a week and was known as the best foxtrotter of her unit. The pressure had eased by Christmas and Mildred Forbes wrote home about her pleasure at giving out Christmas stockings to the wounded men, stockings that had been prepared by the women of voluntary organizations back in Canada. Really, I have never seen children more delighted than these men were with their stockings. When I went into the tent, the men were lying very dejectedly in the darkness. When the stockings appeared, they bucked right up and their pleasure was a sight to behold. December also provided a first for Canada. On December 5th, heavy shelling occurred close to clearing station number two. The explosion shook the ground, Claire Gass wrote. Then she calmly went on to record voting for the first time in her life in the hotly contested Canadian election. The nurses as officers on active service were among the first Canadian women to gain the right to vote. Living conditions that winter could be harsh. In 1917 and 1918, many nurses lived in wooden barracks, though some were still in tents and others in flimsy canvas huts with wooden floors. What you see on the screen is a lovely photograph of nurses outside their tent in the summertime. Imagine living in one of those tents in the wintertime. Some hospital wards were in huts and others were still in tents. Anne Ross describes that winter succinctly as cold and shortages, with one bucket of coal allowed per week for two nurses. Harriet Drake had to wear two or three layers of sweaters to keep warm, while Wilhelmina Mowat wore her gloves at breakfast and her hot water bottle froze daily. Even Mildred Forbes commented, all we sisters are hobbling about with chilblains. Everyone is borrowing larger boots. Typically, she also thought of the men who have such a hard life here and do without so much that the simplest thing pleases them. Poor souls, they are just about being frozen now. The nurses were to be severely tested in the months to come as Germany decided to attack in the spring of 1918 before large numbers of American troops could enter the war. The first attack began on March 21st, 1918 on the Somme front against the British Fifth Army, the second in the Arras area, and the third beginning April 9th in the Ypres area. But the Canadian casualty clearing stations were affected before the German push began. On March 16th, Claire Gass at clearing station number two wrote, rumor says messages have been dropped from Hun planes warning civilians to leave Paparinge as it will be heavily shelled. On the 18th, she wrote, continuous shelling of our camp began about 9 p.m. Ironically, neighboring number three sent its sis sisters to number two that night after about 20 shells fell in the vicinity of the hospital and only about 15 yards from the nursing sisters' quarters. The next day, both casualty clearing stations were evacuated and the sisters were bundled off to St. Omer in a hurry. As the Germans advanced and the British retreated, 
the members of two Canadian surgical teams were caught up in the chaos. Canadian nurses Johnson and Carpenter, members of flying operating teams, a surgeon, an operating nurse, an anesthetist who was sometimes a nurse, and two orderlies, marched 20 miles with a retreat, camping on the roadside and setting up dressing stations anywhere they could. Nursing sister Johnson set up in a hen house on one occasion. As the clearing stations closed down, the hospitals felt the pressure. Number three Canadian stationary stationed at Delance, about 27 miles north of Amiens, was operating as a casualty clearing station on a large scale. Stationary hospitals usually had up to 600 beds. According to Matron in Chief McDonald, on March 21st, 276 casualties were received. On the 23rd, 1,064. On the 26th, 1,622. On the 27th, 1,932. And on the 28th, 2,333. <clears throat> It became necessary to place two patients in one bed and one on a mattress under the bed. Only 37 nurses staffed the hospital when the German advance began, but they were reinforced by British sisters evacuated from clearing stations, plus 12 nurses from another Canadian hospital. Eventually, a dozen operating teams worked simultaneously to try to cope with the casualties. Matron Edith Campbell reported that number one general had taken in 2,218 patients with every available space covered by beds, including the Red Hot Cross Recreation Hut and the canteen. At number three general hospital at Boulogne, Harriet Drake and two other sisters dressed 237 cases surgical between 7.30 and 4.30 on a single day of the advance in early April. With her usual droll sense of humor, Harriet added, après la guerre, one of us will be able to do up Montreal. 123 sisters were attached to the hospital in early April to meet the emergency. The redoubtable 44-year-old Mabel Quint was one of those sisters. Mabel Quint had managed to enter the CAMC by dint of lying about her age. Um, she made herself several years younger than she actually was. She had been one of the original 100 Canadian nursing sisters, and she had also been one of the first nursing sisters, Canadian nursing sisters, to arrive in France in December 1914. She had been quite vocal in her attempts to improve conditions for her soldier patients in Lemnos during the Gallipoli campaign in 1915. But after sterling work had to be carried off the island on a stretcher when the hospital left in early 1916. She was hospitalized in Egypt and on the dangerously ill list for several weeks. And she had then been invalided back to Canada as unfit for further service. But she battled authority again, went on duty in England in early 1918, and was positively delighted when the emergency call came for nurses to go to France in April. According to her, number three general was also turned into a huge casualty clearing station. Wounded came straight from the field. As she wrote, infected wounds and gas gangrene were the most serious and difficult cases, with amputations being more numerous than at any other period and tetanus prevalent. As far as possible, the nursing work was made efficient by creating wards for the various conditions. Chest cases in one ward, fracture cases that couldn't be moved, concentrated together, and mustard gas cases also all together so that they would get careful nursing. On April 9th, the Germans launched their attack on the Ypres area. Still at Remy siding with clearing station number two, Claire Gass noted the number of villages falling to the Germans 
and the increasing pressure on her unit. On April 12th, she wrote, the operating room is working night and day. Some shelling in the neighborhood tonight. At 9.30 in the morning on April 14th, the nurses were sent away at half an hour's notice and the patients were evacuated. The sisters arrived safely at Arnica that morning and that same afternoon, Gas was doing dressings for the walking wounded there. Her clearing station would reopen at Eskelbeck in late April in tents instead of huts, with Mildred Forbes, still acting matron, organizing the arrangements for the nursing staff. In the meantime, Alice Isaacson, stationed with number six Laval, one of the French Canadian hospitals, was waiting impatiently for action. Her hospital was packing for a move and waiting for orders, even as every other hospital was overflowing with patients. The long battle continues, she wrote in her diary on April 18th. The line sways back and forward. British, French, American and Italian, Portuguese and Belgian are in the struggle. On the 19th, she queried in despair, when shall we move? Blackly underlining each word. Inaction was difficult to bear. Up the line at Escobec, Mildred Forbes and her staff struggled with many, many hundreds of English and French casualties and a shortage of nurses to care for them in late April and early May. Breakfast at 7.30 and dinner at 8.30 at night with not a spare moment in between except the hurried lunch at noon, wrote Claire Gass. When she finally got a day off and went to Boulogne on May 20th, the rarity made it a wonderful day. Euphemia Denton wrote home from a top that duty calls. We are and have been very, very busy and will continue to be so by all appearances. Fierce fighting means work for us. She added, you have the agony of waiting and watching things from such a distance. My heart aches for the mothers in this war. 25-year-old Catherine McDonald, who had arrived at the same hospital as Euphemia in March, reported, I've not written for two or three days, but have been so busy that when I got off duty, I was too tired to write. The war news does not look very good, does it? We're simply rushed. Poor fellows, they have some awful wounds. Tiredness was a given throughout that long, difficult spring not just because of the rush, but because of the bombing raids, which increased through April and May and continued throughout the summer. Mabel Clint, who at five foot 11, towered over her colleagues, commented humorously that when a number of us foregathered in the dark in some central hut on these occasions, and sisters off duty were doubling up beneath beds in twos and threes, the site I selected was quite popular. Mabel was too tall to fit under an army cot, so she had to remain on top of one. And there was apparently quite a competition to get under her bed because of the extra protection. On May 1st, Elsie Collis arrived back at number one hospital in a top after sick leave, and she went on night duty almost immediately. On May 9th, she was happy to welcome her friend, Gladys Wake, nicknamed Bob, with a group of 10 new nurses. Saturday, May 19th, saw number one rejoice at the opening of a new dining tent for the patients who could walk. It was a beautiful, sunny day, but the night brought horror. Elsie Collis on night duty, her distant guns just as she was on her way to supper at 10.30 p.m. She had just reached the kitchen door when bombs began to drop. In two hours, German planes dropped 116 bombs on the unprotected hospitals in the ATOP area. Collis wrote an account in her diary of that terrible night. There were several bombs in the mess quarters that set the rows of tents on fire. Two dropped outside the nurses club 
another outside our new quarters. The whole place was wrecked. Poor little Bob, her friend, Gladys Wake, was buried. She had a fractured femur, a huge wound in the other leg, and several smaller ones. A Miss Catherine MacDonald was killed. She died of hemorrhage almost immediately. Several bombs dropped on the officer's lines. There were about six of us in the kitchen on the floor. It was dreadful. We could see the fire through the window, hear the men shouting and calling, hear bombs dropping. The guns would all stop for a minute until the machines came within range. All one could hear was their continual buzzing, then the guns again, then the bombs. The windows all fell in, dishes kept breaking, the plaster walls fell in. We were sure the next one would hit us. When there was a lull, we hurried back to the wards where the NCOs and men slept, a number were killed and nearly as many were wounded. The operating room was busy the rest of the night. No orderlies were left to ready the operating room. So the sisters got everything ready, windows and entrance covered with thick gray blankets. And even while the bombs were still falling, the surgeons and nurses were operating on the urgent casualties from the raid. Nursing sister Catherine McDonald was killed instantly, while Elsie's friend, Bob Gladys Wake, died of her wounds on May 21st. Sister Margaret Lowe also died of wounds. 66 patients and medical staff at number one general were killed or died of wounds and 73 others were wounded. Number seven general next door to number one also experienced the severe bombardment with numerous casualties. Two of its nurses, Helen Hansen and Beatrice McNair were the first Canadian nurses to be awarded the military medal for their courage under fire. Euphemia Denton, who survived the raid, found it hard to realize that I am living. We are so thankful, she continued, but I will never forget the cries of the wounded sisters. Denton had nursed both Bob Wake and Margaret Lowe and was very sorrowful about be not being able to save them. Three more raids hit the top area before the end of May and on the 31st, number one again suffered heavy damage despite the walls of sandbags that have been built at the sides of the wards. Matron Edith Campbell reported that since the previous raid, patients were lowered on their mattresses and given sedatives each night. According to one of the other nurses, that sedative consisted of a tot of rum or whiskey. She also reported that this raid was much harder to bear. Many of the patients she wrote were terribly unnerved, naturally brave as they were, lying there helpless with only a thin roof between them and death. But while the matron was ensuring that the sisters sleeping in one of the tents were all right, they heard singing. The voice of a Welshman rose beautiful and clear without a quaver in a nearby femur ward where men lay trapped by the apparatus that held their legs immobile. As the women listened, other voices joined until most of them were singing. In this raid, Campbell's own office was destroyed and bombs hit three of the wards. Edith Campbell and three of her nurses were awarded the military medal for their courage under fire. Shortly after, number one evacuated its patients, transferred its staff, and closed down temporarily. Elsie Collis stayed on to evacuate her femur ward and calmly wrote of the nurses' unusual night quarters. We are all going to the woods to sleep, she said. She kept her spirits up by enjoying the rides to and from the woods, that beautiful spot, as she wrote. I have never heard so many birds. They seem to sing all night. Euphemia Denton was less philosophical. She much preferred the hotel that the sisters slept in in turn to the woods because you actually got a good night's sleep there. Number three stationary in Dulens was still hard at work dealing with casualties when it suffered an air raid on the night of May 30th. 
A bomb scored a direct hit that smashed through three floors, the NCO's sleeping quarters, a wounded officer's ward, and the operating sisters, the operating theater, where an operation was in progress. The patient and the operating team were killed instantly, including the nurses. When stoves overturned in one of the wards and set fires, nurses Eleanor Thompson and Mary Hodge, the wounded themselves, put out those fires and evacuated their patients, sliding them over the rubble to safety. They too received the military medal. June brought more tragedy when 14 Canadian sisters drowned when the Landovery Castle, a hospital transport ship returning from Canada, was torpedoed on the 27th. 234 people died when the ship went down. The sergeant in charge of the sisters' lifeboat survived and praised their fortitude. He wrote, they unflinchingly and calmly, as steady and collected as if on parade, faced the ordeal of certain death as their boat drifted, its oars broken, towards the suction of the sinking ship. Mildred Forbes wrote home that she knew most of the 14 sisters and it haunts me at night. While Euphemia Denton mourned, each day seems to be bringing new horrors. We are in sadness now over the loss of the hospital ship. So many of our sisters, girls I knew so well. Oh, it is terrible. Thankfully, the German advance was finally checked, though not without casualty clearing station number four, having to pack up and evacuate at six o'clock in the morning, one July day to avoid being captured. On August 8th, the Canadian troops spearheaded a daring British and French advance against the German lines. In three days, the Allies won back 12 miles of territory. According to Canadian historian Tim Cook, this was the start of a three month campaign that was one of the hardest ever fought by the British army. The only compensation lying in the fact that they were winning. He continued, the war was in its last stages, but the casualty lists were mushrooming fast. The war had never seemed more painful. The Allied hospitals, including the Canadian clearing stations and hospitals, were full to overflowing during this time period. All sense of friction with, between nations within hospitals disappeared in this final effort. Canadian operating teams served with British casualty clearing stations and vice versa, and nurses were appointed wherever they were needed. Three Canadian nurses, <clears throat> pardon me, took over the nursing on ambulance train number four on August 16th. The train evacuated soldiers from clearing stations and hospitals. On October 22nd, Gertrude Gilbert recorded, two or three coaches of Germans among my load being taken back to Rouen. Her train followed the advance. On August 30th, it rolled up to Vecmont, west of Amiens. She could hear heavy firing at lunchtime, but very distant. The village was absolutely deserted except for troops and the casualty clearing stations nearby. They loaded at 6 p.m. with a full train. Patients were even crammed in the dispensary and unloaded at Rouen at 6 a.m. Gertrude noted with relief, all patients alive when they arrived. Ambulance work was especially difficult because of the confined quarters, heavy responsibility and irregular hours. Like many other nurses, Gertrude Gilbert found relief by reveling in the beauty of the countryside and exploring the many towns she passed through and doing a little shopping when she could. For instance, she noted the badly shelled towns beyond Amiens, but she also recorded lovely country wooded and hilly with lots of blackberries along the track. She also enjoyed meeting the sisters, British and Canadian, at casualty clearing stations and hospitals, often having tea with them or being offered a badly needed bath. We see her here. She's the third nurse from the left sitting on the ground and Alice Isaacson is standing back center. 
Harriet Drake took a course in anesthetics with the Harvard units and returned to casualty clearing station number two in Escobec as one of a number of nurse anesthetists who worked on operating teams dropping ether. She worked at high pressure, but she also wrote home about good times. Their matron, Mildred Forbes, arranged the sisters' mess and tea hour as much like a well-appointed house as could be, a reminder of home and a civilized social life where male officers, young and not so young, were always welcome to stop by at tea time. Laura Holland also helped the men of the unit with a concert company for entertainment, and Harriet Drake threw herself enthusiastically into helping out when Mildred and Laura left the unit. Mabel Clint, still at number three general, thoroughly enjoyed the Canadian concert party, the Dumbbells, who were drawn from the 4th Canadian Division, and who went on to fame in the post-war years. And I would add that my great aunts and great uncle toured with the Dumbbells after the war. Others report the joy of dances and fancy dress parties, necessary amusements to relieve their stress. By October, good news was heard throughout the hospitals, even as the influenza epidemic hit. Isn't the war news splendid, Mildred Forbes wrote home early in the month. She and her friend Laura Holland, after a year at clearing station number two, had asked to be transferred to a small hospital near the Jura Mountains. But within a few weeks, they were transferred to another hospital near Bordeaux, where they landed in a fearful epidemic of influenza with only three sisters to cope. Mm -hmm. We have been working fearfully hard, Mildred wrote. The cases have been terrible and the deaths appalling. Our senior medical officer has been taken to Bordeaux and we cannot help but wonder if we're going to be able to escape ourselves. With few medical officers left able to work, Mildred was largely in charge of care. The French government awarded her the Médaille des Epidemies en Argent for her work during this time. Others were also glad to hear the welcome war news, yet were still coping with casualties and the epidemic. On October 31st, Alice Isaacson rejoiced at the rumor that the Kaiser had been asked to abdicate, but mourned the deaths of 10 patients on her ward from the flu, calling the disease almost a plague because of its prevalence. When the armistice took place on November 11th, few of the nurses did more than comment on the fact. Claire Gask merely noted, capture of Mons by the Canadians and Germany surrenders to armistice terms. Gertrude Gilbert, still on the ambulance train and on the way to Mons, was so excited by the news that she couldn't sleep the night before, but she made no comment on the day itself. On the 12th, her train arrived at Frenoy to find the station had been blown to bits by a delayed mine and seven people killed. It was a sober reminder of the ongoing impact of war. Annie McDougall had moved up the line with number one clearing station, and on November 11th, her 300 bed station was trying to cope with 1400 patients with no additional staff. There was no particular jubilation at the news of the armistice. As the war diary stated, the war was not over as far as we were concerned. It seemed that only Alice Isaacson stationed near Paris saw real celebrations, though she seemed puzzled by just who was celebrating. Although Paris streets are one solid mass of happy, singing, cheerful people, she recorded, the French are not so hilarious as I expected them to be. Most of the noise is made by American soldiers. And the work went on. The clearing stations moved up with the troop. Mabel Clint, with clearing station number four, arrived in Mons in November to find few supplies. Little coal and no gas and candles did duty as best they might. Pillows were at a premium despite the many patients with flu, and even the fourth floor of the convent they were housed in became a dormitory for 50 men who had to lie on, their, on the floor in their uniforms because there were no beds or bedding for them. Gertrude Gilbert's ambulance train began to load emaciated British prisoners of war 
liberated after the armistice, and many of them, starving and sick, arrived at the clearing stations and hospitals. The nurses remained busy well into the new year until the flu epidemic had died down, the casualties were well enough to travel to England, and the need for medical staff was greatly lessened. With more time off and the war won, many nurses took the opportunity to sightsee and explore the countries they worked in for so long. Mildred Forbes and her friend Laura Holland relaxed in the sunshine of the Riviera, while others enjoyed Italy, England, and Scotland. Many were also given the opportunity to tour the battlefields, and their photo albums are full of the images of ruined towns and cities and the places where battles were fought. For these nurses, such images would have represented more than ruins. Each represented the convoys of men rushed back to the clearing stations and hospitals after each action, the men the nurses fought to save. Most of the nurses had returned home by July 1919. Many of them had been away from home for more than four years. 64 had earned the Royal Red Cross first class and four earned a bar to that decoration. 253 received the Royal Red Cross second class, eight won the military medal, though it should have been the military cross and one received the Royal Victoria Medal for nursing King George V. 169 were mentioned in dispatches, while over 50 received French and Belgian awards. Seven Canadian nursing sisters were killed in action or died of wounds. 14 died when the Landovery Castle was torpedoed and at least 18 died of illness. Of the nurses who have accounts I've used, Mildred Forbes earned the Royal Red Cross first class, the Medaille des Epidemies on Argent, and was mentioned in dispatches. Mabel Clint and Euphemia Denton were awarded the Royal Red Cross second class, as was Mildred's friend, Laura Holland. Edith Campbell was awarded the Royal Red Cross first class and the Military Medal. But the war did not end when the Canadian sisters arrived at home. A number married and had to resign, while others, such as Mildred Forbes, Laura Holland, Claire Gass, and Harriet Drake, took courses in the new field of social work. Still others, given priority for government nursing positions, expanded public health nursing. Male veterans had many organizations to help them make the transition to civilian life, but there were no such official organizations for female veterans in Canada, whose experiences had also been emotion, emotionally and physically demanding. That being the case, the former military nurses took action themselves. In April 1920, 44 former nurses who had served with the Allied forces or with volunteer organizations overseas gathered in the western city of Edmonton, Alberta, and began the Overseas Nursing Service Club. Once a month, the nurses gathered together to socialize and also to raise money to help their former patients, male war veterans. And by doing so, they recaptured the camaraderie and their shared memories of the war. To give you an example of what it was like to be a former war nurse in Canada, Former matron in chief MacDonald, who was the Edmonton Group's honorary president, was now living in Nova Scotia. And she once run, wrote to them about running into one of her former nurses on a social occasion involving other women. Of course, the two began reminiscing about the war and one of the other women present sighed and made it clear she wished they would simply be quiet. The Overseas Nursing Club was perhaps the only place where the women who had shared the urgency of tending to convoys in the night, had felt the explosion of bombs and shells, had laughed together and helped one another cope, could gather to talk, to reminisce, and to help one another again, this time to make the transition back to civilian life. As word spread, 
New clubs sprang up in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Halifax, Ottawa, Winnipeg, right across the country. In 1926, the Overseas Nurses and the Canadian Nurses Association worked together to fund and open a nurse's memorial. And the nurse veterans gathered in Ottawa on Parliament Hill to unveil the tribute to the First World War sisters and to Canadian nursing history. And you see a few of those former military nurses gathered on the right. In 1929, the chapters amalgamated into the Overseas Nursing Association, which became a powerful force for female veterans' rights in Canada. And when the Second World War began, the First World War veterans not only organized blood banks and fundraised and did other such works for the war effort, they also opened their ranks to admit and help the new generation of nursing sisters to cope. At least one of those chapters, the original Edmonton unit, was still active as late as 2015. These women, veterans of the First World War, had transformed the meaning of nursing sister. As veteran Emmeline Robinson's beautifully crafted artwork shows, and you see it here, the nurse veterans of the First World War had truly become a sisterhood, a family of Canadian women bound by war and their dedication to their profession and to the soldiers they cared for. Thank you very much for listening. Andrew, that was absolutely absorbing and thoroughly enjoyable. Thanks very much indeed. Wonderful research there. It's fantastic to hear the, the first-hand accounts of, of, uh, of these nurses. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you know the routine now, so whilst we can't be in the room and, and um, do a round of applause, we can do it virtually. So if you care to use the raise hand button on, on the Zoom screen, please do so now. And, and Andrea, I can confirm that there's hundreds of hands going up as a virtual round of applause for that. So thanks ever so much indeed. Um, it, Thank you. <laughs> no problem. It, it's Q&A time. And, and if anything, we, we've had as, as more questions, I should suspect, than, than, than um, I've seen before at this stage in the presentation. So you've um, <laughs> really engaged with the audience here. Um, Alan, hello, thanks, you're, you're live. Um, fire in your question, please. Andrew, good evening. Um, that was a wonderful talk for which many thanks. I'm speaking to you from a little town in England called Buxton, which during the war, yes. during the Great War, had a Canadian special hospital mm -hmm. and no more than 500 meters from where I'm living now was um, an annex to that, which um, housed and treated sick nurses, one of whom, Sister Ada Ross, died and uh, TB, and along with, uh, along with more than 20 of her compatriots, uh, probably ex-patients, is buried in our local cemetery in a Commonwealth headstone. I was quite interesting at the beginning to hear from you that that um, that uh, the outbreak of war, nursing in Canada was regarded as a respectable profession. I'd always thought that here in England too, but a few years ago when the um, Testament of Youth film came out, uh, Shirley Williams, the daughter of Vera Britton, uh, I'll say now that I think Britain was a ghastly whinging snob described nursing in those days in England as a, as a, a for want of a, word, a better word, um, a low-grade profession. Um, I rather took offence at this, being the, the grandson, mm -hmm. son, stepson and uncle of nurses. Um, do, you, do you have any kind of view on, on first off, whether you, whether you think that's in any way representative? Secondly, what, what, if anything, was the, the reason for the disparity between the perception of nurses in, in, in Britain and Canada? Um, thank you both for telling me about Ada Ross and um, Buxton. Um, I had, had read about Ada Ross um, and how she became ill. 
and of course was buried there. Um, the question about Canadian and British nurses. Um, I am not fully an expert in the British nursing system at the outbreak of the First World War. However, I will point out the difference between Canada and Great Britain of the time. And so it was not unusual for women to work in Canada. Um, so obviously still the traditional path for most women would have been marriage. Teaching and nursing were two of the more respectable paths they could take. Teaching was not well paid. Nursing did offer independence and also the chance for authority because many of the nurses went on to take on administrative positions. Um, the history of nursing in the two countries, Florence Nightingale had a tremendous influence in Canada as well. And one of her nurses did come to Canada to start the first training school. Um, but I think it's the difference. I know there was a stratum of families in Canada where working was frowned upon for women, but they, they tended to be the better off classes. Um, not nearly as many. Canada still had economic classes, but the divisions between them weren't as clear. And Canada did open its universities to women, at least some of them from the 1870s onwards. So my best guess, I've read many Canadian women's autobiographies. Um, it seems to be expected that they would go out to teach or to nurse or to do charitable work in the community, at least up until they got married. And if marriage wasn't your route or you had a yen for authority, you would move into nursing. It was still questioned, I would point out, by. Um, I have read in some oral interviews by First World War nurses, especially those who came from, say, farms or small villages, that their families questioned their choices. But um, as I said, the example of socially elite families' daughters taking up nurse training in the early 20th century gave an example to others. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Yeah, pretty. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, pretty much. I guess. Thank you. Thank you for that. I had I had the chance, which I could have done at a local literary festival to tackle Miss Williams mm -hmm. about this, I would have referred her to Edith Cavill. Um, Edith Cavill mm -hmm. was 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 the daughter of a country vicar. Um, whatever mm -hmm. she was engaged in, it wasn't a low grade profession. Well, we could also point to Faith Moulton, I believe that yeah. was her name, um, yeah. who was Vera Britton's um, nursing sister colleague uh, in one of the wards who was from quite a well-connected family as well. I'm mm -hmm. sure there were any number of well-connected British nurses. And of sure. course, Britain's, Britain's perspective is only one perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I got halfway through the book and gave up. But thank you. Thank you very much for that. I will email you with a bit more about uh, about Buxton and uh, Ada Ross. Yes, thank you very much. In fact, uh, when I take my laundry to the laundromat tomorrow, I will pass the very uh, route of her funeral procession. Thanks, anyway, Alan. Enough, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Alan. Sarah, um, if you, I know you've asked a number of questions. Can you just limit it to one and I'll come back to you later? To, to pick up any of your later ones if we if we get through all the other questions. And I'll try to be more you. concise. No, I'll sorry. try to be more concise. No, no, it's all right, Andrew. Don't worry. No, it's fine. <laughs> Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much. As you can see behind me, I've got Le Trapport up there because, yeah, um, I've also researched uh, nurses. I'm trying to look a lot on the, the Serbian side. Now, I appreciate this is about the Western Front, mm -hmm. so I'll keep it to that. Uh, one of the things you mentioned, um, one of my questions is, you were talking about um, them get voting in 1917. Were mm -hmm. a lot of the nurses who joined up, uh, were they suffragettes? Um, like the Scottish Women's Hospital, 
cohorts that were predominantly suffragettes and things. Was that a, mm -hmm. a thing in the Canadian force, nursing fratern sorority, sorry, or, or was it more mixed? Um, you know, the, the nurses whose accounts I've read don't mention much about that. Mabel Clint was uh, certainly wanted more rights for women. Laura Holland, who wrote a whole series of letters home to her mother, um, did not feel that she, well, she was writing in 1915, and um, she certainly saw the disparity between the way that male officers were treated and the female officers in the Canadian Army. It did upset her. Um, she did say at the time she didn't want the vote, but let me tell you, none of the nurses I'm aware of turned down the vote when they got it. So I think even if they did not express themselves as suffragettes would, um, the experience of the war and being female officers with rank pay and privileges and not being treated the same as the male officers on a number of occasions um, really brought out that gender disparity. The nurses were practicing. Remember, they were independent, paid, professional women. So they were practicing examples of independent women who didn't necessarily speak out and become vocal or say that they were suffragettes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th thanks, You're welcome. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. I'll, I'll come back to you later if, 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 if I need to. Gordon, Gordon, you want to um, chip in with your question there? Yes, thank you, David. Andrea, what a presentation. Fabulous. I was absolutely blown away with the content. Really good. Uh, my question really is, um, what was the casualty rate like amongst, amongst the nurses? And were the nurses that were killed repatriated back, back to Canada? Or were they buried where they fell? Um, the nurses were buried where they fell. Mm -hmm. uh, 2,800 nurses, seven were killed in action or died of their wounds, so not very many. Um, two of the nurses who served on Lemnos were um, two of the number who died of illness. Um, their graves are on Lemnos. Um, the casualty... Casualty rate among the nurses or casualty rates among the soldiers in the hospital? Nurses, yeah. uh, Amongst you know, the PTSD, nurses, yeah. Amongst the nurses? shell shock, things like that. Um, <laughs> records about that remain, um, shall, I, shall I say, unstudied as of yet. Not a lot. Uh, of the, so, for example, just to give you an example, um, oh dear, her name is slipping my mind. I want to say Catherine. Catherine Duar wrote a book about Prince Edward Island nurses during the war. That's Canada's smallest province, but it sent a number of nurses over during the First World War. The first matron in chief of the Canadian military nurses was Georgina Pope. She was a veteran of the Second South African War. Um, one of the first Canadian nurses to go overseas to nurse. And in 1917, she was sent overseas. Um, she had been, um, she was no longer matron in chief at that time, but she was yeah. sent overseas. She became matron of, I think it was number two general. And uh, there were a number of bombing raids. Um, she was diagnosed with, in quotation marks, arteriosclerosis, although her symptoms simply didn't match with that diagnosis. diagnosis. Also with neurasthenia, she was sent back mm. to England, um, sent back to England relieved of her matronship, but because of her status, um, remember she really started organized yeah. the Canadian Army Military Corps Nursing Service because of her status, the word shell shock were never mentioned. But she was eventually, after spending some time in convalescent hospitals in England, she was eventually repatriated to Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I know of 
several nurses who applied for pensions on the grounds of what we would now call PTSD, um, saying that the war had affected their health and their nerves. Um, they were essentially dealt with about the same as the men, which is uh, unless yeah. you have evidence from the war, you're not getting your pension. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question no, more that's, fully. That's, but... that's perfect. Were there any male nurses? Did the men go as well? Um, male. So I know of male nurses in um, psychiatric hospitals in yeah. Canada, but I don't know much about them during the war. No. Okay. So I'm sorry, don't, that one, that one I can't. The... get the female perspective on ladies, women going yep. to war, and it's fascinating. There should be more of it. I'm sorry, there is one exception. The VD mm. hospitals. There were <laughs> very yeah. few women. Some of the nurses did work on the VD wards, but for the most part, those were staffed by male medical staff. Andrea, thank you very much for your time and trouble. It was fabulous. Enjoyed it enormously. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Right. Um, I've got a couple of very similar questions, which um, I'll ask on behalf of Hetty Sheely and Brian Evans, who've uh, both picked up um, what was the reason for the award of the military medal um, rather than military cross, as they were commissioned officers. Um, Brian suggests it might be gender prejudice, but I wonder if you've uh, certainly a couple of questions on, on that on that front there, if you'd like to address that, Andrea. Um, so it was gender prejudice. Uh, the nurses as officers should have gotten military medals, uh, sorry, military crosses, because that was the officer's award. However, after great controversy, um, all the usual reasons were brought up. The nurses were not under fire in the field, even though they were under fire in the hospitals. Um, nurses were not under fire in the field and um, they didn't actually have right of command except over the, the people serving in their wards. Um, so there were a number of arguments made. Uh, someone did write a master's or a PhD dissertation about this. I have not been through the whole thing, but there was a great deal of controversy about it. And the male government made the decision that nurses would only get the military medal. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that um, answer there, Andrea. So um, Elizabeth Anderson, Elizabeth, do you want to fire, fire up your microphone and uh, ask your question there? Hello, uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, and David, I've just got Elizabeth on here, it's Pat, just in case he confused. Um, I, in the Great War, all the nurses, they took great pride in hygiene, washing the uniforms, however difficult it was um, to wash them. And, and it was essential, really, to stop infections and everything. But mm -hmm. you said they'd got two rows of brass buttons down the front. Now, this would have made it very difficult and to clean them. And I wondered whether they were detachable or whether they used, you know, they got the brass button cleaning. Yeah. Stick. Whether they. Um, so whether they let me them. let me just take a look. See if we can get this up here. Um, here's Elfrida Atril's uniform. I know the uh, the bars on their shoulder with the stars on them were detachable. Um, don't know if I can make that any larger. To tell you the truth, I can't answer your question and I don't want to be inaccurate about it. I really would suspect that the buttons were removable so that the mm. uniform could be washed without them. But I have not specifically checked that point. So I'm no. sorry, I can't answer. No, fair enough. I, it was just, I, I just wondered because yeah. it's a daily uniform as well. And, and they did keep them in immaculate condition, even though the conditions were difficult. So I, I just thought it yes. was very complicated for, for mm -hmm. a uniform. 
Well, and, and, it's a good it's a good question too because nurses had to do their own. Um, mm -hmm. Officers, of course. Well, one of the differences was, for example, on Lemnos, that the uh, male medical officers had each had their own Batman, and the nurses, the twenty six nurses plus matron of the unit had two Batman for the entire lot. And about the only thing they seemed to have done was brought around water for the nurses to wash in in the morning. So the nurses cleaned, they put their own laundry out. Mm. Um, and if there was any button cleaning to be done, they would have had to do it themselves. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks very much for your question there, Elizabeth. Right, let's um, have a look next. Uh, Dick Richards, Dick, do you want to just uh, unmute yourself? Thanks very much, fire away. Thanks, David. Thank you, Andrea, really absorbing talk. Thank you very much indeed. I was thinking about those nurses who served several years on the Western Front. Where did they take their leave, generally? Did they tend to stay in France or did they come to England? Um, it really depended, you know. Um, even in 1918, many of the nurses, while the war was still on, headed straight to London. And from there, if they had a longer leave, if they had a week's leave only, they would generally head for London and possibly stay there. If they had two weeks, they would usually go to Scotland or to Devon or to some nice part of England that had been recommended to them and uh, revel in the peace. Yeah. And then spend a few days in London on their way back so that they could go to theaters and things like that. Um, towards the end of the war, Mabel Quint, for example, went to the Riviera um, in late October, 1918. So the Riviera was then open to them. Um, nurses tended to go to Italy after the war was over. They don't seem to have stayed in France uh, while the war was on. I, I really have, except for the Riviera, I really have the sense that they wanted to leave the reminders of war behind them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question. Th thanks for that. Um, next question I'll read out for Edward Astill. Uh, Edward asks, um, did Newfoundland uh, provide nurses either with the Canadians or independently? So Newfoundland was not a part of the Dominion of Canada at that time. It didn't join until 1949. But I can report that nurses from Newfoundland did join the British forces, both as nursing sisters and also as VADs. Super. Th thanks for that. Um, next, Sandra. Sandra Taylor. Um, hi, uh, Andrea. Fascinating, like everybody says. Uh, before I ask my question, a couple. I've got one nurse on my database I've researched who committed suicide through her while she was still serving. Mm. She jumped out of a window, a British oh, nurse, dear. but that was over her nursing. She couldn't, what she'd seen. So there mm -hmm. is a thing as PTSD in, even in those days. Definitely. Um, and there were some male orders, uh, male orderlies I came across who were men who'd been wounded and weren't well enough to go back to the front. And so they were used in the hospitals until such time as they could be shipped back overseas. So we did have males, mainly in England, because yes. they were them out front in the trenches. Um, my question was, um, prior to 1898, there was a bit of an official nurses register here. And from 1898, they did bring in one that was a role of midwives and a register of nurses. They didn't make it compulsory till after the First World War, but quite a few nurses do come up. Is there such a thing for the Canadian nurses if they're trained nurses that have done three years in training do they have to be on a register at that point or does that come in later and if it's available can it be researched is it, is it available to look at online um so i i would like to go back and address the orderlies when i talk about nurses i'm talking about graduate nurses who had graduated from three-year training programs so male orderlies did a great deal of work uh, in Canadian hospitals. 
Um, Canadian nurses apparently provided more bedside care than British nurses in the same positions, but they were responsible, the Canadian nurses, for training the orderlies in their wards. Mm -hmm. So I did see a comment about um, acknowledging the orderlies, and they most certainly do deserve that. And Canadian nurses do mention their orderlies in their accounts. Um, second part of your question about the register. So the major cities in Canada with private nursing services did have registers, um, but they were simply lists of graduate nurses who were available for private cases. Canada had official nurse registration in 1920. And that's when the, the RN designation came into use. Right. That sounds like similar to here because we, um, yes. even now, I, I'm a nurse and we have to register every three years mm -hmm. to be able to practice, not on the list, you're out, out in the cold. Um, it wasn't compulsory here, I think it was 1921 it came in here, so we were a bit behind Canada mm -hmm. as usual, but that, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Th thanks, thanks, Sandra, for, for the question. Okay, next I'll, I'll read out the question from Adam Andrews, who has no camera or sound. Uh, Adam asks, were hospitals deliberately targeted by bombs, i.e. From, from the air by the German Air Force? You know, I read about, <laughs> I read about that just the other day. Um, some of the nurses were in fact, convinced that the hospitals were deliberately targeted. Um, after the, the first bombing raids began, a couple of the, the Canadian hospitals deliberately put very, very large red crosses outside the hospitals. I mean, the German explanation for bombing in those areas was that the hospitals were close to important railway lines that were transporting soldiers. Um, some of the sites actually were not. So some of the nurses and the medical staff were indeed convinced that these attacks were deliberate. There is controversy about it. I wouldn't want to come down on one side of it or the other without doing additional reading. I can only tell you what the nurses wrote in their accounts. Thanks for that, that's that's great. Um, next question, I'll, I'll read it out from Richard Crompton, who, who was just asking, inviting you to, to uh, uh, tell or expand on the account of the Doulons bombing and the death of Canadian nurses and the wonderful painting. So the bombing itself, um, that of course took place in late May. Um, I have read about it. Um, most of the material by nurses, first-hand accounts of it, most of that comes from the matron in chief's account. And it also comes from GWL Nicholson's uh, Canada's Nursing Sisters, which is his, um, his account of the history of nurses in Canada, military nurses in Canada. I don't know that I can expand on it much more. Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. Don't, don't worry about that, Andrew. Let's let's just move on. Yeah. To the, yeah. Um, uh, 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 perhaps a, a slightly um, e easier <laughs> question here. Uh, yeah. You can certainly expand into this one. Uh, Edward uh, Barkaway, Barkaway asks, "Can Andrew recommend a book, please?" Um, yes, a few of them actually. Um, Cynthia Toman, hang on one second, I'm just going to vanish for one instant. Um, so if anyone is looking for an overview of the history of military nurses in Canada, um, Canada's Nursing Sisters by GWL Nicholson um, is quite a good start. If you are looking for... Um, an account that focuses directly on the First World War, Cynthia Tolman, Sister Soldiers of the Great War. Um, Cynthia researched all of the files of Canadian nursing sisters during the First World War. You will not only find her research about the cohort of overseas nurses in there, 
but you will also find analysis of each stage of the war. This is um, the first history of Canadian nursing sisters in the First World War in English. Um, my brain is starting to slip. Um, there is uh, the very first history of nursing soldiers, nursing sisters in the First World War is in French. And um, I have that book, but it's behind glass over there. And I think it would take too long to look for it. <laughs> so if anyone would like to email me, I'd be happy to supply that. Um, I'm only going to show you one other book and I hope you don't think I'm trying to push my own works. If you're looking for letters, War Torn Exchanges is the letters of Mildred Forbes and Laura Holland, two of the nurses I mentioned today. It's their letters home from 1915 to 1919. Um, I edited it, which is why I'm kind of shy of showing it. No, not but, at all. Please, please do. Yeah. Um, but really, honestly, these are riveting letters because they weren't separated uh, except for a weekend. So the whole four years they spent at war, um, they were together. Uh, they were best friends, and you get two different perspectives. So where one leaves off, the other one fills in. So I hope that helps. And I'm sorry if I missed out on anyone. The last book I should mention, and it's somewhere in the stack over there, is uh, Susan Mann edited The War Diary of Claire Gass. Uh, 1915 to 1919, and that is also a riveting account of a nurse's experience during the war. Super. Th thanks for the very full answer there. That, that's, that's splendid, Andrea. Um, we've probably not got an awful lot more time for questions, but let me just uh, give a shout out for Angela Hall's question. I can't seem to get Angela onto the panel here, but I'll ask Angela's question for her. In such difficult conditions, what attention could be paid to hygiene and sterilization, and did failures occur that led to deaths from sepsis or similar problems? Um, actually, the nurses in operating rooms do mention, on occasion, for example, uh, on one occasion, for example, one of the nurses I mentioned today talked about uh, catastrophic failure in the operating room when a bomb hit nearby and all of the sterilized instruments fell all over the floor. And um, um, at that time, the only thing she could do was take the set uh, and try to sterilize them as best she could with alcohol and iodine. So there was careful attention paid to things like sterilization and cleanliness and um, Canadian nurses were quite well trained. Obviously they had to be innovative. They had to deal with circumstances. The one thing that I would mention here is if we look at private Fred Lloyd, who, um, as I said, near the beginning of the presentation, he was wounded on July 31st. Um, he arrived at a clearing station, was passed on down the line. He arrived at a hospital on August 2nd. Um, there was such a flood of patients going through the clearing stations and such. You can't help but wonder if those wounds to his shoulder and arm, if he had been able to stay somewhere, um, if there had not been such a flood of patients, could that arm have been saved, given the soil of France um, that we know it caused, caused infection and gas gangrene? Um, but hygiene, sterilization, all of those things, regardless of circumstances, uh, were paid careful attention to. Super. Th thanks for that, Andrea. Right, a quick question here from David Friedman. Oh, I can't get onto the panel. Um, I suspect the answer is going to be no here, but let me just uh, test you out on this. Is there any record of nurses being captured by the enemy? Um, British nurses, yes. Canadian nurses, no. That surprises me. So the answer is yes, certainly for British ones. 
Well, British ones earlier, early in the war. Oh, gosh, um, really? Yeah, in 1940, yeah, with the... Yeah, 1914. Yeah, 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 sure. um, first Canadian nurses arrived in France in December 1914, and some of the Canadians came very close to being captured in 1918 during the German advance, but they did manage to escape, um, even if they had to walk. Sure, that's that's grand. Th thanks for that. Okay, uh, Campbell Gordon, Campbell, off you go. Thanks, Andrea. That was a great presentation, very enjoyable. Can you tell us a little bit about the recruitment process to get the nurses to sign up? Was it all <laughs> volunteer? Was there some kind of conscription? Was there bribery? What was what was the process? It was influence. There were so many applications for the positions available because, of course, the nurses knew that their training and their skills would be valued. Um, that they could really do work overseas. Uh, those first hundred nurses, uh, when I look at the nurses who were chosen, a number of them did have political connections and influence, and the same thing happened in 1915. Um, what Matron-in-Chief McDonald, with the Minister for War intervening on occasion, had to do was try to balance so that nurses from across Canada were chosen. And she also wanted to make absolutely certain, and she did have to fight for this, that all of the nurses were trained. And despite her rigor, there are several examples of untrained women um, being put into the contingent by, by the Minister of War but there was no need for conscription. Every place could have been filled wow. 10 times over. So you had Canadians who couldn't join the Canadian forces. Canadians joined the American forces. They were with the QAs, uh, some of them, unable to join the, the Canadian military nurses, joined the British Red Cross. Interesting, great, thank you. You're welcome. Probably more than they needed. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thanks for that. We'll probably go now to what's probably going to be the last question, um, which um, I've got here on my screen from David Bounds. Um, David has said the following. A previous reference to Vera Britain reminds us that at the outbreak of war, many early British hospitals in the UK were, were established by aristocratic women who considered their experience running mansion estates eminently suitable for this role. Subsequently, many privileged yeah. but untrained women volunteered to serve on the front, like Vera Britain, where they often came into conflict with professional nurses and who felt the volunteers undermined the legitimacy of the profession. Was there any evidence of similar occurrences among the Canadian nursing services? Um, that's an interesting question, and thank you for that. Um, because voluntary nurses, for the most part, were not allowed to nurse in Canadian hospitals, there wasn't nearly as much of a clash. None of the Canadian hospitals that I'm aware of were started by aristocrats um, because the Canadian hospitals came under mil military jurisdiction. So... The Canadian hospitals that I've spoken about today had commanding officers. The nursing corps in them had a matron who was responsible for the good running of the nursing staff and the hospitals. And um, the nurses were all trained graduates. Uh, one thing I would like to add though, and one thing that I did not talk about today is conflicts between the Canadian nurses and some of the British matrons. So Canadians were considered colonials. There was some controversy about them being made officers and receiving the pay of officers. So at war's beginning, um, the Canadian nurses, the first hundred received a great welcome from the nurses at St. Thomas. However, some of the nurses who came over in 1915 were assigned to British hospitals in France where, for example, one matron disapproved of their uniform 
and refused to let them nurse until she had checked to make sure that they were actually legitimate. So there were some clashes. Um, Canadian nurses were freer than their British counterparts to do things like go to dances, entertain officers, et cetera. So there was some friction, but by 1918, that was gone. But I just thought I would add that in, but there was none of the aristocratic women starting hospitals business. Thanks for that. I'm sure that fully answers uh, the question that, that got typed in there. Andrea, superb talk. Thanks very much indeed. And I'm very grateful for your time and efforts here tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, David, for inviting me here. And um, thanks everyone out there for listening. It's been really enjoyable and I have thoroughly enjoyed the Q&A period as well. Thanks for joining us. Super. Thanks very much. And good night, everybody. Thank you. Mademoiselle from Armitage Park.